had six panelists, four of which were members from coming to the table to speak about slavery and the, and the heritage of slavery in contemporary America. And after the, and after the panel, uh, four of them spend the night in the Bush Holly House as a part of the Slave Loan Project. Again, Joe McGill has been spending many nights in, in slave quarters. This is one of the first times where he actually had other people spend the night with him. Uh, tonight will certainly be different. Uh, tonight will be the first time that I've knowingly stayed, uh, shared the experience with a descendant of a slave owner. I took it as a challenge to try to, to find and meet a living descendant of an African that my family had enslaved in New England. And despite being told that this was simply impossible, it took me six months to find someone. It's all of our history, and it should be preserved. Um, not just for you know my children, but for all of our children. Um, so I'm very, very grateful that um, Joe's done this project and that um, Bush Holly House sees the importance of preserving these kinds of dwellings um, and this history for our nation. Both personal, economic, legal, religious, on, in every aspect of life, um, we cannot separate this history. Very difficult to research. Uh, an enslaved person or even a free person of color uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And to be truthful, where they usually intersect with public records is in the land records uh, and in the official documents. Anything to do with property. I think that we can find more examples uh, like the Bush Holly House and what they've done. Uh, then we can inspire those others out there uh, in possession uh, of such property to, to come up to, the, to this stage. And I really I want to um, reiterate what Joe said about um, my appreciation for the Bush Holly House being willing to be upfront and candid and engage this history, not in terms of you know, articles and written material, but inviting people who are finding a way to live with these stories to be able to um, support the work that they've been doing for the last couple of years. And I was referred to this group called Coming to the Table, who are based out of Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And since 2005, this small group of people who was started by descendants of Thomas and Martha Jefferson, the White Jefferson family, and Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, the African-American side of that family, folks from that group have been having conversations since 1999 when the DNA story broke the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And the idea of bringing together people who had ancestors who were enslavers who had, and other folks who had ancestors who were enslaved, to have some really honest conversation about what that meant, <coughs> to try to understand this legacy that we have all inherited, in a sense through no fault of our own, but once once you become aware of a story like this within your family, um, most people, either they try to push it away or drive it back down, or they, or they want to spend time to try to understand how they're going to make sense of carrying this particular kind of history. I felt very close to them the minute I saw them. And um, a lot of this is based in emotion for me. Um, it's very hard to articulate exactly of what, what really is going on in my heart. But um, part of it is that it's a thrilled meeting after 200 years. It's the, uh, the tragedy of what brings us together. And it's the hope that we can heal. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share this experience with Joe tonight here in this wonderful place. Uh, I got invited to do a fellowship. I'm a writer and I'm, I'm writing a book about this history and I got invited to do a fellowship. Turned out that the place that I was doing the fellowship on was right down the street from a um, university that used to be a plantation. I, I would go there often because it's such a beautiful place and one day I noticed that they um, had this little cabin and I inquired about it and sure enough it was a slave cabin. And they, this, this university, it's called Sweetbriar down in Virginia, was doing a lot of work to preserve um, the history, the artifacts that the people who lived there had used. 
And they had also uncovered a cemetery on their grounds of, of about 60 enslaved people. So, I mean, that's, that's really a remarkable discovery. And these people weren't related to me at all, but just being there. On Sundays, some of the other fellows would go to church. Um, I would go to the cemetery. Because for me, it was like such a sacred place um, that I could really um, just be. I would notice that there was not a lot of attention um, paid to the back part of the house. In a lot of cases, they were not even there. Uh, and, uh, and for legitimate reasons, uh, some of those reasons being that they weren't built of, of material that would actually last for very long. Or uh, it might have been the case where, you know, if the building exists, you have to pay taxes on it. So, you know, why, why, why keep it on the landscape if you're not using it and, and, and you have to you know, pay taxes on it? Uh, those things are excusable. But uh, what's not excusable is the uh, malicious intent to get rid of those type of structures to try to erase that part of history. Uh, so, uh, I felt that if I could find these places, uh, and beyond finding them, ask permission to spend a night in these places, with that would come some attention. Uh, attention to uh, the good examples that are out there, like the Bush Holly that's, you know, uh, placed the resources uh, and the time and effort into saving such places, give them the, uh, the recognition for, for doing that, applaud that effort, but at the same time, it, would, it could bring attention to those that are uh, on the verge of collapse. But one of the disturbing things is to me that, yes, it's true that you will have many missions such as the 1838 one that you mentioned, but many Connecticut residents also live part-time in the South or have moved South. And I found at least one example in the Norwich probate records of a Norwich sea captain living part-time in Norwich, part-time in Mobile, Alabama. His probate record in Norwich in the 1850s indicates that he owes, owns um, Ben worth $600. So there were, even though slavery had been abolished in Connecticut in 1848, there were still Connecticut residents who owned slaves, but not in Connecticut. How did slavery end in Connecticut and in New England? I mean, we had it, how did it end? And then how do we not know about it? I mean, how did that get erased? And part, manumission, those manumissions are part of that story. Um, it's not really my area, because I'm looking at an earlier period, but just to give you an idea, when the revolution came and there was a lot of political rhetoric about equality, freedom from England, um, it became actually, there was not legislation, there were not court decisions here in Connecticut that ended slavery. What happened was it became socially unacceptable, slowly, starting in the 1770s. And so there was a process of sort of individual, gradual manumission. Starting, tradition, starting conditionally. Um, usually, what would happen is, you know, they'd say, you know, after you reach the age of 30, you'll be manumitted. Um, and it became, you know, sort of frowned upon, frankly, not, you know, among the, the you know, English origin New Englanders, um, not to eventually manumit their slaves. So the, the number of slaves dwindled, start. Pretty quickly, if you look in the 1780s, 1790s, um, slavery is it's a very sharp decline. And part of then what happened is a whole ideology in New England of forgetting. Because New England at that point wanted to set itself up at, in, in, um, at, as distinct from the South, slaveholding South, and this, this whole uh, um, sort of juxtaposition became very extreme, obviously, as the Civil War started to come. And New England, New Englanders wanted to forget that they ever had anything to do with slavery. And they did a pretty good job of, of getting people. Now, it's also because of the group coming to the table. Uh, there is a more 
a spiritual connection um, to to the state dwelling project. Uh, I'm not saying that that's what I want uh, out of the slave dwelling project, but it, but but it's, it's just what it is. Uh, when I was uh, in at that gathering three weeks ago, uh, I, I was I was told that you know the ancestors are with me whether I want them to be there or not. Uh, uh, you know, again, this is my 31st state tonight, and, and uh, sometimes when I stay in these places, I'm alone, and I don't need my mind wandering uh, into places that I don't think I can handle. Uh, although my ancestors may have some good intent, uh, you know, what they endured was, you know, they, sh they, should not, they should not have been subjected to that. No one sh should have been sh subjected to that. So although their intent uh, might be great for me, uh, I gotta keep my mind on the physical. Uh, I gotta keep my mind on finding the next place and, 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 and being ready to to spend the night in that uh, in that place and, and, and try to garner as much attention uh, for that place uh, as possible. You know, if there is someone that that want to come uh, and share that experience with me and attach. The spirituality to it, uh, however they want to interact uh, with that place, uh, you know, I invite them to come on and, 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 and share that experience uh, in their own way. But it's because of coming to the table that I, I'm, I'm happy to share uh, that space with Greg tonight.